and welcome to the See Word the Conservatives podcast. Today we're talking about dynamic objects. I'm Jenny Mathiason, an objects conservative based in Camarthenshire. And I'm Chloe Rumsey, an objects conservative based in Greater Manchester. Welcome everyone. Hello. Today we have a special guest host to help us tackle this uh, amazing topic. Would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners? Yeah, my name is Matthew Reed, and I'm a clocks conservator. Hello. Also, that's short and sweet. I like that. Clocks conservator. We're done. <laughs> Excellent. I like it. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, um, <laughs> 45 minutes later. <laughs> yeah, I'm um, uh, what we call uh, nowadays a dynamic objects conservator and a clockmaker as well. In my time, I've done some teaching and some making. I've been self-employed. I've worked for national museums and regional museums and the heritage world and just about everything really you can do in a sort of career of of being a conservator. My background is really a, a kind of family thing. We are from a third generation uh, retail jeweller, uh, which is still going today up in the frozen north. And um, that began with my grandfather, who was uh, an instrument maker during the Second World War. Oh, wow. I don't understand it from a biological or psychological perspective, but it somehow got into my under my skin, as they say. And some of his tools were kicking about when I was young and uh, it became an itch that needed itching. So that's how I got into clocks, basically. And then Westin College trained and the rest is uh, history. I was going to ask, actually, was it the clocks or the conservation that came first? So it was the clocks and then West Dean led you towards conservation. It actually wasn't West Dean that led me towards conservation. It was working at the observatory at Greenwich, really, that that got me Ah. conservation. I was a retailer, so a retail jeweller, everything super bling, shine it up, polish it up and so on. Although in my defence, I kind of had tried a couple of efforts at um, what I would now call sort of more conservative practice. And they'd fallen on stony ground. I tried a bit of training with other institutions. I went through West Dean, which was absolutely brilliant, time of my life, um, when it was only uh, a year-long programme. And then I got a job at the observatory in Greenwich. It was it was a nice role because it was partly conservative, but also partly uh, assistant curator and I was sort of ploughing on. And then one day I was having a conversation in the reserve collection, as you do. And I was looking at this 20th century uh, little um, plastic primarily uh, mechanism. And I was really dismissive about it. And the curator said, oh, no, wait a minute, Matthew, you know, why are you making these judgments? And my brain kind of exploded basically at that point, And nothing was ever the same since. And so I began to question everything and deconstruct and uh, everything's been a hundred times more difficult <laughs> since that moment <laughs> but I that's that was the beginning of the conservation journey so yeah long answer but yeah conservation came uh, later and then making which actually informed my conservation practice massively so that order. I love that moment when you can pinpoint the moment of when a perspective was changed or a switch was flicked or or something. It's rare, but I really I really like it when people can pinpoint that moment. So what do we mean about dynamic objects? You've already highlighted, Matthew, that it was clocks, um, but it bridges such a huge number of collections, doesn't it? What would you say it is, Jenny, with your with your definition? And then we'll see what we all think. I mean, I had a go, but then... (laughs) (laughs) Um, Surprisingly difficult to define, but also it's it's trying to be a broad term, which I really appreciate. So um, I think on the dynamic object group uh, on Icon, uh, it said device is meant to have moving parts, which I think is... It's quite mm. good. But then I immediately started asking questions like, does that mean not large industrial objects? Does that mean anything that's working object? And then I, like, it, I just kind of went down a rabbit hole of just questioning everything. I think that might be a red thread for this entire episode. <laughs> yes. Question everything. <laughs> I quite like the devices meant to have moving parts. I, I, I don't know what you think about that, Matthew. It's one of those. You're absolutely right. It's a, a, a thread that could be pulled and pulled and pulled. I think, yeah, this idea of things that move is probably, I, I stole that again from the Dynamic Objects uh, Network, which I'm just beginning to be a bit more closely involved with. And that's a kind of tricky question because, of course, not that there is such a thing as a person on the street, but let's just say 
you were to ask that person, and I don't know what they'd say, but they might say something like uh, steam engines, uh, machines, sort of the what I would broadly describe as the sort of what you might say are sort of blue collar things. So lots of oil, lots of grease, lots of heat, lots of dangerous moving parts. Um, and then I, I noticed on the Dynamic Objects Network uh, page, on the icon page, they just say things that move. So a book, for instance, I think falls under that definition of a dynamic <laughs> object if yeah. you want to open the book. And, and this actually gets closer to the, uh, as far as I think, the kind of nub of the problem or the nub of the question or the dialogue. Let's just say, take that thing, I don't know anything about steam engines, so I'll talk about something I know nothing about. Uh, <laughs> a clock, let's talk about a clock, which is probably a bit safer ground. Most mechanical clocks, you could make a, a decision and let's say you have the clock working, as in operating, or you don't have it working. If it's working, it's a dynamic object. If it's not, if it's a book and it's um, on the rack and it's been digitised, that sort of opens up a new question. But very broadly, I would say things things that move. For me, a dynamic object, again, I'm um, a bit of a bear with a small brain, as uh, somebody said. I was just trying to get this. I was at the time cycling and uh, on a bit of a cycling holiday in Greece. And um, somebody drove alongside in a car, wound down the window and said, are you going to this amphitheatre? I don't know who this person was. They just said, you've got to go. You've got to go to this amphitheatre. So I made a detour over the next couple of days and rocked up at this place. And it was, obviously, I, I was a tourist, whatever a tourist is, and it was thronging with tourists in the in the days when these places were. Buses coming and going, people taking photographs. But I was getting really annoyed and thinking, what you know, what are these people doing? They're not, of course, being... <laughs> sort of like a judgment they're not actually looking again nowadays of course I'd never say that but then and what happened was uh, a woman uh, uh, walked into the center of the amphitheater and took out a violin from its case and started playing no wow. announcement Aww. and for 30 seconds uh, the whole place fell silent and it was the most sort of hairs on the back of your neck moment and uh, total transformation and she only played for 20 30 seconds and then sort of slightly embarrassedly put the instrument back in the case and walked off and what really shocked me about that was you know I was just riveted to the spot and again my brain had kind of gone you know some enormous twisting going on inside it and people understandably they just went back to their business and I thought right that's what a dynamic object is as far as I'm concerned that is a really good way of thinking about it. I absolutely love it. Sometimes it is those sorts of transformative moments when you see something working. I mean, I, I suppose it's a bit like anyone who grew up with like one of those cuckoo clocks. And when the cuckoo came out, that's all it was about. <laughs> like the, you, you barely cared that it kept time. It was, it was about the cuckoo. <laughs> Completely. I mean, a lot nowadays the, about grannies or granddad's uh, quarter striking mantle clock really were incredibly out of fashion but between the 20s and the 50s 60s you know lots of people had these things and of course it becomes an incredibly ingrained and positive childhood memory of going around to granny's on a sunday and the clock would be doing its westminster chiming every quarter of an hour another great example of this at the science museum I was in there one day and they have a loom i don't know whether they still do this when they reopen it's one of my examples just the same story the thing is one thing and it's sat there and it's all been done up and it's looking really beautiful and then when i was there they fired it up and of course it makes this incredible noise and again, the whole place stops and everybody looks up to see what's going on. And again, that's just the same example, really, of what constitutes a dynamic object, which, of course, leads us on to the killer question. Well, if it was intended, if a loom was intended to be a loom, then it should be a loom. I mean, there's so many different things to get out of what you've just said. Firstly, uh, there is something about there is very much about the feeling of a place and the sounds in a place and especially with the violin in the amphitheater and I have an example of um, standing in St Fagan's house in the living room and there was a ticking clock that sounded 
absolutely exactly like my granddad's ticking clock and all the smells were the same and the the feeling of the room was the same with the different furniture and I just started crying just the feeling of something being used as it was intended or having the same kind of feeling we're context driven animals and if you move a thing from A to B, it becomes a different thing. If you if you move that loom from wherever it was in a factory to the science museum, it doesn't uh, necessarily sort of change its hierarchy, but it, I think, um, arguably changes what it is. And therefore, it changes what it means and what it does in the context of that space. And that is uh, kind of a whole lot more interesting, really, than the wheels and the sprockets or whatever they're mm. called going around and... <laughs> which kind of oil to use and that that kind of thing. Again, I think the amphitheatre and the clocks are actually really good examples because there's something about it kind of sets a, sets the pace of life. It's a performance that is there to be enjoyed. It is a clock that chimes at a certain hour. It's something that is the rhythm of life. If we can keep that going, then that's a little bit extra magical. And I, I think that's, I mean, very waxing, very poetic <laughs> right now, but that's, you know, it, there is something very poetic about having these things and still using them in whatever capacity we can. And of course, that's, you know, rife with conservation conundrums where it's like, okay, well, the wear of the object and do, do, do things have to be replaced? And, mm. you know, like it, it does open up a lot of interesting questions. And also, I think, makes people feel very fighty because then is it is it restoration or conservation? And oh, my God. It does make people very fighty. You're absolutely right. And that idea of performance is a really key issue because, uh, as you may or may not know, I'm for the past 10 years or so, I've been working with the Bo Swan Automaton. Um, That's another uh, of my examples. Yes. Drop that, drop that into, the, into the conversation. But very briefly, not talking about the swan per se, but if you imagine, and let's abstract it a little bit from the Bose Museum, but let's take um, what you might think of as a regular art gallery, for instance, or a, a museum with um, a static collection, so-called static collection. Uh, those static objects, uh, you have to kind of engage with them in a way, you have to work with the collection that uh, you know, in, in the old days, used to be part of the job of a curator. Maybe it still is. So so the visitor, the casual visitor, again, if there is such a thing, has to kind of work with that. Whereas your clock uh, that you described and the swan, they work for you. And I think this is a key point in how things are changing. Uh, again, I very broadly describe them as being sort of blue collar and white collar in a way. And uh, so, yeah, the idea of performance is really central to a lot of this stuff. As I was trying to prepare for this episode, I was spending a lot of time thinking about kind of large versus small objects, because we've already had an episode kind of on large objects, and that has tended to be things like massive vehicles or pieces of industrial equipment and that sort of thing. I think it is included in the dynamic objects category, mm. but how um, maybe a lot of the focus of the dynamic objects that we think of might actually be things that are sort of finery in some ways. You know, things that are, are quite, uh, not frilly because they have function. But I think it was interesting the distinction with like performance versus kind of working with an object or... I think that it's really interesting that we've got three very different... I mean, even just talking about the recording of this episode, three really different attitudes to what this episode will mean because I've come at it from essentially the ethics of moving objects and the you know why why are people why will people be interested in this it's because sometimes people have a conversation with say a curator or a head of media or whoever it is in their museum to explain either why something has to work or why it can't work or why it can't work more and when I was looking at preparing for this, there was so many different things that I didn't expect, like the Bow Swan, for example, seizing up because of lack of use and the looms in the Science Museum sort of having less meaning because they don't work or because when they don't work. Mm. Um, and what does an mm. object mean? What does the meaning of or interpretation or communication of an object mean if it's inherently meant to move? If just seeing it static, what does that mean? Does that, does that, is that communicating the object? Probably not. 
I, I think it's uh, it, it's just a different thing, isn't it? When I'm asked to approach these objects, and I think obviously, it's like all conservators, you know, the approach is actually a massive part of the deal because if you get launched right into it, then uh, you tend to lose a little bit of objectivity. And so, as part of my approach to something that's uh, so-called meant to work, is um, is is really I think of it in extremis of. It works the whole time, 24-7. What's that going to mean? Never stop, ceaseless sort of industry and output. And then the opposite of that, it's um, like the uh, Antikythera mechanism, for instance, a, a Greek uh, astronomical mechanism that was found in oh, yeah. Anyway, the point is that the original mechanism is so uh, heavily corroded and so on and so forth and bits missing that it would be um, almost out of imagination to uh, rebuild that. So that's my kind of first position um, is to think of it an extremist. I quite like it. I mean, because I immediately started thinking about things like uh, what's what's the value of a dynamic object? Is it that it must work? Is it that it was once working? Is it still a, still a dynamic object if it's broken? Probably not so much, but it could be one again. And like, I had all these questions, right? I think a lot of it came from me watching a lot of the repair shop recently <laughs> and how many people... How many people would come in with, you know, clocks and stuff and being like, I want to, I want to hear it again because that's part of my childhood or it's a memory or um, I would just like it to work again. Uh, don't change anything else, but make it work again. And like their value was often the kind of memory associated with the noise and it being functioning. In some ways, the value there was it working and it reminding them of something. And Obviously, you know, we know from working in museums and heritage settings that value isn't one mm. thing. Uh, maybe it's who it belonged to or if it's really rare or where it came from or some other aspects of its, of its history. And some of the value can be that it works or that it can be made to work or that it can show something or tell us something about how something was manufactured or how um, someone found a way of doing something insane like i don't know making an elephant's trunk move <laughs> you know it's all of these amazing things I, I i agree i mean so many uh great points there in in what you've just said and uh of course it's what the the difficulty with everything in conservation or a difficulty is what things fundamentally are and what they mean and those questions are so difficult to penetrate and the dialogue needed does make your brain melt the sort of easy thing to do is to repair a clock and get it ticking because that somehow works around the much, much more difficult question of what that is, what it means. To go back to that point about is it still a dynamic object when it's static, I would say the answer is probably yes and should. There's no such thing as should, but, you know, that could be part of any approach um, and at least it should be a consideration. Well, I actually have two topics to kind of bring in at this point. Basically, how we tackle dynamic objects in museums as conservators and firstly so what do the what does the visitor want what's the interpret what does this mean to the t interpretation of the object um an example for this would be one of the institutions i've worked for in the past um they used to bring their cars out all the time they had a big hall of three or four cars that worked and i mean sort of 1913 type age but they don't do that anymore because the museum changed uh, ownership or management, I should, maybe. And when I've spoken to people about this example in the past, sometimes the visitors think, oh, it was such a shame. What's the point in the car being there if it's not coming out, if it's not being used, it's not been driven for, you know, 10 years, 12 years, whatever. What's the point in that? And so the kind of challenge I suppose that we're faced with in museums with objects that can move whether they do or not is when to move them and why and how much they can move what's the justification for or against getting them moving and then what does that mean to the value if we were to just stop moving something and if something does move when do you stop it, <laughs> if it, it like, what mean at what point <laughs> if movement cause obviously some movement keeps something going 
yeah. um, is a form of conservation in a way. But also, if they, if you know that there is damage being caused to the object, at what point is that too much damage and you have to stop it? When does this, what, what are these decisions that we have to make? And what's the harm caused to the meaning and function of the object? Oh my God, there are so many risk assessments here. Uh, I know. So. <laughs> I think risk assessments, I think, is one of those, like, we could just, you know, put a massive circle around that. That is one of the, e- that thing is, that's the easy answer, though, because driving a car from 1913, oh my God, all of the issues mm. that could be, you know, it went over a road, oh my God. But that's sort of like the cheats response. I, I agree. I mean, it's. Um, I think there's a change of foot, isn't there? I, I don't follow sort of latest conservation thinking probably as closely as I should. But again, not. I, I'm not saying it was a, a, a cop out or a cheat, but that idea of saying, "Well, we're not going to run these things because we want to preserve them for the future." Uh, that that broad model has served us for, I don't know, a couple of decades, let's just say for sake of argument, maybe a bit more. I think that's changing, isn't it? Because as you absolutely rightly said, you know, operating a thing, whether it's the skill to, uh, you know, what are you preserving or what are you trying to rebuild, preserve skills or regenerate skills in mechanics, in craft, which is inextricable from conservation in my book, um, that experience of people with these with these things. Again, it's a little bit of a cop out, but the dialogue, the discussion, the debate tomorrow is a new day. And, uh, you know, you make a decision. And I, th- I think that idea of damage and wear is really tricky and interesting, because if you change as this is something that conservatives do the whole time. If you change that word from damage to change, then it's not necessarily seen in such a pejorative way and change for the bad. It can be change. It's just change, which, as we know, is inevitable and, uh, you know, entropy and all that stuff anyway, which doesn't help one jot with <laughs> somebody was sat there and saying, we want you to write a policy on dynamic historic objects and their operation, because that is the reality of it and it comes down i suppose to cost benefit somebody's got to analyze what the wider the widest sense of cost is somebody's got to an- analyze what the widest sense of benefit is and then stakeholders or individuals make a decision and it, i think if we can as a profession just extract ourselves a little bit from that must has to should sort of mentality um there's a great Example, I think it was at uh, Leeds Temple Newsom or somewhere like that, one of those really incredible collections that I'd been asked to uh, repair a clock, uh, a long case clock, tall case clock for our American listeners. We did that. We worked out a conservation plan and da 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 treatment, all that stuff, all done, delivered it. And on the day I delivered it, there's this clock which has maybe got, I don't know, 200 components, you know, metal, painted, iron, wood, glue. Um, glass and ticking away striking everybody happy and then right at the side of it is a chair which uh, um, (laughs) furniture conservators out there will be going oh Matthew you don't know what you're talking about I don't know what I'm talking about (laughs) but appears to be like six or eight pieces of wood glued together with a rope across it and quite reasonably and like a do not sit thing here so dynamic objects from that sort of a do we run them do we not run them perspective but I think we're still at a stage where, I, I don't know, I mean, you you tell me how you perceive, um, let's say in your collections, you have got a clock and somebody said, wouldn't it be nice if we had that clock running? What's your kind of feeling about that sort of approach? How, how would you feel about it? Well, I think the first thing that you said just then sort of surprised me, actually, because it made me realise change rather than damage I have completely come to terms in my museum or well in my professional life I suppose with the idea that plastics are going to deteriorate and they're going to they're going to leak and go yellow and all of the things all of the lovely things they do and I've completely come to terms with that I say, yeah, go for it um, for PVC banners in my collection because I know, well, I'll do these things to make them last longer. But they're going to, you know, probably in 20 years, we won't be able to hang it. It'll just be that'll be that that's that for that object. And so I think I come to, came to terms with that, partly because I just don't have a choice. 
if we don't take the objects then they'll never be on display they'll never be sort of considered part of our collection in terms of the interpretation of history but for some reason I was thinking that the decision for whether to make a working object work or not was a different one but it's not the only difference is whether I think that the working is necessary as the lifetime of the object and if it is then the damage that's caused potentially caused by the object working is just as inevitable as the passing of time and so you know whether or not this object goes yellow or these connecting surfaces start to wear down is it's just the same it's the passing of time and the action of the object creating or change or damage how does that make you feel if you if you if you've faced with a, a textile or a book or a piece of glass or something? I guess you've got strategies to deal with that as um, you know as museum or as conservation professionals. You know what to do. You've got a plastic toy. We all remember them uh, from when we were young. You buy them for a couple of quid down the corner shop. Uh, a frog that swims in the bath, and yeah. so you've got oh, deteriorating plastics. You've got pogs and gears and oil and all that all that kind of stuff the question is jenny you're faced with this thing what are the kind of emotional responses to thinking about maybe operating it filming it operating letting people interact with it and that kind of thing because i my I, i've been in it so long i've completely lost objectivity but my sense <laughs> is that when I see other museum professionals look at this stuff, they kind of, it's a mix of horror and then they sometimes bail out and just say, we're not the experts. So anyway, what's your uh, emotional reaction to that thing? I mean, so I am shockingly pro-use and I, I think I actively know She is, we've had arguments about I, it. I, I think I, I think I make <laughs> a lot of museum professionals feel feel quite queasy with how eager I am for things to be used and seen and used. Uh, so my emotional reaction is, yes, sweet, let's make it happen. Let's uh, figure out how we can make it happen. Uh, what can we do? Cause I, but I think a lot of this comes from interacting with the public as well. Mm. You know, like if people see a clock in a gallery that isn't working, people will sometimes go, it used to be working, it was really nice. Or why is that not working? Or, you know, like, I feel like people take an interest and like it's similar with mm. if there's a piece of... Uh, m- machinery on display or something like oh what would that have sounded like what would they have looked like uh why can't we turn the handle on that sometimes people ignore all barriers and go in there and try to turn <laughs> the handle you know like it's it's something so human to want to see something working that i'm so incredibly for it we we already know that i'm a very pro touch person as well which freaks people out but that's fine <laughs> um uh, that, there's a whole episode on that too um but I started thinking about this as I was kind of reading some articles around kind of the use of working objects and stuff like that. I started thinking, well, you know how we're very gradually moving towards, okay, well, maybe we can let people touch things because it does have a lot of benefit mm-hmm. and blah, blah, blah. We'll, we'll mitigate the risks, blah, 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 grumble, 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 grumble. But we'll let people touch things sometimes. Okay, great. That's, that's a step forward. Um, I started thinking of operating as the equivalent of touch, but for something that isn't static. Even seeing it operated, ideally they're in front of them so they can get the full experience, but even in recorded format, that is the equivalent. It is use, it is access, it is um, granting life to something that would otherwise be quite dead. And I mean, surely mm-hmm. museums have been in the business of dead things for quite long enough. Right? <laughs> they, right? One might argue they embody that themselves. But anyway... Um... <laughs> And then there's that counter argument of, well, if you if you use it, you use it up and you've got to fix it, change it. And all that can be seen both positively and uh, negatively. And then, of course, something we haven't talked about yet, uh, computers, which I don't know anything about either. So yes. computers, are they dynamic objects? In fact, one of the uh, founder members of the Icon Network, uh, Ken Cobb, is an electrical engineer and I think there's a kind of growing feeling that there needs to be a symposium or something about electronic components and computing. I'm 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 so into this, but I, you have to remember that I'm the daughter of an of an engineer, so I'm well into this. 
the notion that computers and robots and uh, tape decks and pinball tables, that all of them are dyna- dynamic objects and they all super duper deserve to be talked about more and that they are very much something that needs needs to be used and should be used. And if we can't use it forever, then we should try to document as much as we can about their use and how they're used and emulate and put things on archive.org and all of that stuff. Right? I am so into this. Um. <laughs> And I've actually been able to speak to Ken now, so should we listen to that? I'm here with Ken, who has a particular specialism within dynamic objects conservation. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi there, Chloe. Well, um, thank you very much for inviting me to participate. Um, My professional career actually started when I was three years old, uh, when sitting in a buggy at the far end of the platform of Euston Station in London. I knew at once that I wanted to have something to do with all the wonderful objects that were moving around me. Those are (laughs) objects and railway carriages and and, and things like that. Uh, Since then, as a chartered engineer, I have studied and worked in the electrical, electronic, fibre optic and telecommunications fields all my life. Alongside this, I developed an appreciation of industrial heritage backed up with visits to manufacturing and processing sites and museums of science and technology, transport and measurement. By measurement, I include the Kakodi Testing Museum at Southwark. I had also started to collect various timepieces. I have and maintain an AM valve radio from an RAM. Avro Lancaster aeroplane on which I used to listen to the news. Wow. <laughs> oh, there you go. Brilliant. So, how did you make the switch between electrical engineering then and conservation? Well, I retired in 2011 and wanted to pursue my interest in clockmaking, but I recognised I needed a professional training. Mm-hmm. So, I spent a year at West Dean College, West Sussex. Oh, uh, West Dean. Yes, we're seeing on practice. <laughs> Love it. Where, whereupon it became obvious to me that I could enhance my skills with the inclusion of a conservation approach to the work I would be doing. So I spent a second year there studying for a master's in conservation studies. Oh, wonderful. It's a fantastic place to study as well, isn't it? It's a, it's a lovely place to study. Yes. I, I After about 40 years in the office job, uh, I found the creative atmosphere at West Dean to be inspirational, filling me with new energy and confidence confidence to expand and understand boundaries in expertise. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, West Dean also instilled in me the significance of interdisciplinary working as the last project I worked on needed metal and ceramic conservators working together to clean many ormolu pieces set on a marble base while I worked on a quality French clock mechanism. Uh, Since then, with the exception of a large object for the Science Museum's new medical gallery, I have worked for private clients on their mechanical and electromechanical timepieces. And of course, I mustn't forget a metronome. So would you be able to define for our listeners, we have got, as you say, um, interdisciplinary, we've got all different types of museum professionals and conservators listening. So would you be able to define electronics conservation um, or I suppose the difference maybe between electronics and electrical conservation? Yes. um, Well, this I found actually quite difficult to to define. Or (laughs) They tend to be, I'm sorry. Uh, I would say that there's no key differentiator between the right. two, as you find transistors, resistors, inductors and capacitors common to both areas. Um, after all, would you call an early analog quartz clock or watch an electronic or an electric instrument? Um, a conservator's approach to each is the same. A general differentiator would be the presence of active components in the instrument, like a thermionic valve, a transistor, an integrated circuit, accompanied by supporting components. This would place the early analog quartz clock in the electronics group and an early teleprinter into the electrical engineering group. I see. Oh, that's very interesting. Okay. So what are the main things to consider when conserving one of these objects, then electrical or electronic, for the purposes of keeping it working or making it work? Yeah, the, the many, many ideas actually spring to mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I, I think that it's a fine call between keeping something working Mm -hmm. and actually stopping it and even modeling it or simulating it or something like that even simulating it on a screen or something Mm -hmm. but uh, but that that then you lose the tangibility of the uh, of the object itself so the first thing that springs to my mind is safety 
Uh, yes. Um, in these objects, there are high voltages. And in most domestic objects, um, electrical objects run off the mains, there's a lack of earthed metalware. So, so you've got metalware um, on, on these objects. And if you touch it, you can get electrocuted. Mm-hmm. Blimey. Um, and, and this applies to early mains driven valve radios and televisions and um, even the mains powered selectric clocks, which are all two wire. There's no earthing involved at all. The, the other, the next area that I th- think is important is that certain components are time bombs, uh, and this is in particularly mains-driven um, electronics. Uh, and you will find that early electrolytic capacitors uh, will explode, uh, and they will explode suddenly. And so you have to be really careful with these things. Is that to do with the deteriorating condition, or is it just that sometimes it can just go? Um, it is. It, these items do have a do have a shelf life, or do mm-hmm. have a, a life themselves, uh, and uh, they will just go. They will just explode. Uh, so sometimes they will give you warning uh, and smoke a bit, but uh, sometimes they will just the, the top will just come off, uh, having having the the with the capacitor um, having boiled away inside for a little while. Wow. Okay. <laughs> So, so you've got other things inside these devices. You've got mercury and beryllium, mm-hmm. um, mercury wetted relays and mercury in some valves and beryllium in low power uh, VHF transmitter transistors are typically used in walkie talkies used by the police in the 1960s and 70s. OK. As an example. Um, so you do have to be careful with that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the other point is that all these components were actually connected together using a lead based solder. Uh, of course. So keep your gloves on. Yeah. Brilliant. So I will take a moment to say if you're interested in any of these things, listening to this, then uh, you can check out our hazards episode. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Yeah, We didn't specifically talk about objects like this, but it's it is interesting that how many um, sort of hidden hazards there are in things that we would take to, you know, think, oh, yeah, I had one of those in my cupboard kind of thing. And and you just don't consider it, do you? I've got a few more points to consider. Um, when conserving an electrical object, uh, organic object, and that is originality of most electrical and electronic components. Now, now, most insulators and fittings are made from a plastic material now, whereas in the past it would have been ceramic, glass, bakelite, silicon resin bonded paper and rubber. Mm-hmm. Now, all electronic components have reduced in size as modern materials and a better understanding of performance limits enable this reduction. In many cases, components are no longer needed to support older technologies, so are just not available. And uh, finally, there's a big judgment call as to whether to change 40 components, both electrical and electronic, for modern equivalents. However, some new old stock, that's NOS, components are available through a healthy trade from the e-commerce auction sites. And there has been a move to remove the working innards of the original components, but keeping the can and wire up and seal a modern equivalent inside. If this component is rare, then the materials used and its method of manufacture are lost at a stroke. And what I mean by that is that some people, uh, to keep the look of the object the same, they will take a capacitor, open up the can, take out the contents, and thereby you've lost all the information as to how this um, object was made, and then put into that can uh, and seal in that can uh, a modern equivalent. And yes, the performance and the function of the capacitor continues to work, but you've actually lost the originality of what was actually inside. Uh, you know, when we, um, that's we, sorry, Francoise Collange and myself worked on the uh, King George Hospital Fund uh, mm-hmm. model hospital, this was one of the things that, that really uh, was was important to us because we were called in just to look at the wiring, the internal wiring that lit the model hospital. And we recognised straight away that the incandescent light bulbs that were used were hot and they would actually mm-hmm. destroy the model itself and destroying themselves. So from that that point of view the light bulbs themselves were all recovered and they are kept within the store of the um, of the science museum but we'll we'll come on to that later another point is a circuit diagram is is really really important for any electrical or electronic piece of equipment and one is almost lost without a circuit diagram it is like being in a city without access to a map of any kind 
when Francois and Collage and I worked on the electrical lighting system within the Wellcome Foundation's King George IV Model Hospital for the Science Museum, our first task was to work out the wiring. No wires are accessible except at the fuse at one end and at any one of 78 lamp holders. Two years later, we were given a recently discovered original circuit diagram which confirmed that we had got it right. Brilliant. That was, a, that was a big moment. That's brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, what um, a fantastic feeling that must have been. It, it really was, actually. So finally then, um, what yeah. has been your favourite electronic or electrical object um, to work on? And I have a feeling I've got an idea of one of them, <laughs> um, well, but um, I'd be interested to see what else you've got to say. OK, well, well, my favourite, um, I think, well, my, my favourite is definitely the work I did with Francoise Collange on the King George IV mm-hmm. um, hospital model for the Wellcome Foundation, which was fun and challenging and touch and go. Francoise and I were brought in to assess the state of the existing wiring as to whether it could be used to continue to light the model from lamp fittings within the model itself. We assessed and determined it could be done only if the existing incandescent bulbs were not used as the model consumed about 300 watts at 12 volts DC. The real excitement was to be able to design and manufacture 200 frosted LED light bulbs that match the original incandescent bulbs in physical style, luminosity and chrominance, yet consumed a fraction of the power. Francoise and I worked closely with the Science Museum conservation team to get these bulbs right, and they were successfully installed by the conservation team for the official opening. Brilliant. That sounds like such a satisfying project. It was it was very satisfying project and it it was multidisciplinary project as well. Um, And uh, I can't overstate the uh, multidisciplinary nature of all the stuff that that we as conservators do. Uh, And in the clock field, uh, you know, we are slightly a jack of all trades. Well, as an objects generalist, I love hearing things like that. <laughs> so thanks very much for saying that. Yeah, that's right. So that's all of my questions. So I'll say thank right. you so much, Ken, for joining us. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, again, at the Birth Museum, um, they have a room that's kind of like a music room and it's got half a dozen, let's say, uh, instruments in there, um, piano and piano type things, harpsichord and so on, which are not used because the minute you tune them, they go out of tune and they need a lot of intervention to uh, keep them uh, in tune and all that kind of stuff. So um, what we did was we commissioned an artist, a guy called Kit Haig, uh, to um, uh, to work with a piano tuner and to sample a few notes and to reimagine that space. Now this sounds incredibly naff, uh, like it's going to be the worst thing on the planet. I but it actually, quite nice, it, actually. <laughs> it worked incredibly well. It it meant that those instruments weren't um, quote unquote stressed. They don't have to be tuned on a sort of weekly basis. And we weren't sort of playing chamber music, you know, in a background through uh, through somebody's iPhone. This was high quality, but I think it's just been reinstalled so people will be able to um, hear it at the museum. Ch- to um, chuck in my two penneth worth, working with artists has been a real enlightenment and they've got brilliant ideas that can help us. So it's not just conservators, obviously, who are making these decisions, but I would say bit of advice look to the world of creatives to help in interpreting these things and they can be quite tangential but in my experience work brilliantly well and also an incredibly good value for money as well yeah absolutely and i mean I, i guess a lot of this comes down to some things can be um improved on by uh, the involvement of artists some things can be emulated uh it doesn't always have to be the actual physical object that is necessarily being played or uh, being used uh, and I think there is definitely a time and a time and another place for things like uh, video footage of something working when something cannot be worked um, for a variety of reasons and that sort of thing I think it is the slightly lesser of the things mm. but that doesn't mean it's not valuable you know like it just because something is second place doesn't mean that it's shite mm. you know it's like that's still <laughs> a good thing um, and it's still 
contributes to people's experience of that object as something that's uh, living and real as opposed to something that's just standing there in the corner to get gathering dust. So I think I think that those things are hugely valuable, definitely. And kind of ties into when we were talking about like replicas and digitization way back in the day, because we were kind of talking about some of these sorts of things uh, when it came to when something should be a replica mm. or when something might be better off being digitized because the mechanic that, say, plays the tune is too fragile or um, too difficult to keep working, uh, that sort of thing. I do always love a a thing that's really working. I just do. I'm a big fan of recordings, I have to say. I think I've I think one some of my best kind of museum experiences have been because of either either audio or visual recordings of stuff. Um to bring in textiles again. <laughs> um uh, does anyone remember seeing the the big pink Balenciaga dress in the V&A? No. And it has some, I think it's called the balloon dress and it has some really beautiful, complicated tyings up inside it to create the shape that it is. And of course it was in a case and you can't get people to do that. You probably can't even, you know, it wouldn't be feasible even to have time slots in a day where the conservators come in and show you how it's put together. So they had a screen next to the case with somebody dressing a replica so it wasn't even somebody Ah. dressing the mannequin that it was on it's it had uh blueprints of the dress like pattern shapes and how it was put together and put on and i loved it i loved it more than the object because i'm really interested in that sort of thing so if you're interested in mechanics and there is a sort of set of you know diagrams of how it's making the noise that it's making and then a recording of the noise do you need to hear the real thing depends what you're getting out of it yeah and sometimes that's definitely the way to go you know like um it makes me think of you know uh videos of uh what i think is uh computer archaeology when people have like <laughs> excavated like an old model of something and then they've had to replace things uh inside so that it does actually work and then they're showing us it working but it might be the last working one in the world mm. but here here it is being documented you know and it makes me think of stuff like uh, i regret i regret not uh, reading this in the run-up to this um, um episode but there's this uh, getty publication on kinetic art mm. um that I'm, I'm gonna link to but it made me think of things like uh, how uh, a lot of the time things like uh, what I suppose we call time-based media and all that stuff, right? It has very intricate instructions with it so that this is how you assemble it or this is how you perform the piece or this is how mm. something is supposed to be working. And honestly, that kind of documentation is almost as interesting as the actual oh, yeah. piece, you know, <laughs> which sounds insane, but like that's that is fascinating like this is how we're supposed to be what building this thing before it goes on display that's almost as interesting as it being there it's intriguing isn't it or are we just nerds (laughs) so i think we're all in this conversation really pro use and pro running and you know even even accepting of damage (coughs) change even accepting of change what would it, if you were te- if you were invited to um, give your opinion in a museum, uh, you know, invited in as freelance freelancer to give an assessment? What would it take for you to say switch it off and don't switch it back on again for a year about an object? It can Ooh. be clocks, it can be electronics. If you're Jenny, what would at what level of this is gonna fall apart or this is at immediate risk would what would the scenario be maybe um maybe i my gut reaction is that maybe i would go at it from more of a health and safety angle Ah, like so it's almost like um if i feel like other people are at risk or it's gonna combust if we keep it running (laughs) or you know like if it's like this will cause the fire that burns down your museum or (laughs) this um you know uh, maybe maybe i would have more of a health and safety stance on it than an object stance initially but super curious to see what matthew says yeah i'd I'd go down the same kind of road which is essentially a, a risk assessment uh route if you take um a, a regular clock like um take a grandfather clock for instance you what do you get for your um wear stroke damage stroke wear stroke damage um when you run the thing okay so you've got to uh, wind it uh, once a week it runs for a week and one winding so somebody's got to go along 
they've got to wind it up, which is an in- intervention more change. They might scratch the dial, da 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 da, um, all that stuff. You've got to get somebody to come along and take it apart and service it once every year or two years or five years or uh, whatever, which is another uh, a block of risk. And um, so what you get for that is you get the ticking sound, which we've just said you can replicate incredibly well today. It's not that expensive. So actually what you get for all that energy and all that change is a little seconds hand ticking backwards and forwards. And it Mm -hmm. might be that you say, yep, it's worth it for that. For me, it still comes down to that um, thing I said earlier about risk assessment and value for money, really, cost-benefit exercise. What are we going to get out of it for what cost? To answer the question, which is an impossible question to answer, what makes you say, don't run it? That thing, cost-benefit and, uh, as you said, a risk, a risk assessment, whether that's a kind of you know, physical risk or whether it's a kind of wide uh, sort of intellectual or uh, sort of business risk, reputational risk. Yeah. I think, boringly, my answer is the same, to be honest. Basically, I have no experience of repairing something like a clock. Oh, me neither. I'm I'm, I'm a a GP of the object world, right? I I can diagnose problems and do, I can do a lot. Like, I am a skilled professional, but that doesn't mean that I can do the equivalent of brain surgery. I've not got the insight, so that... That's luckily where we have you. <laughs> well, the good news is, it's actually relatively straightforward, given that there is all that incredible complexity that surrounds the thinking and the doing with all objects. Because all those, the agents of deterioration don't discriminate between dynamic things and, and static things. Anyway, so you've got all that stuff to do. And then it's just the, exactly the same path as you would have for any other object, let's say putting it on display, is that you decide where it's going to go, who's going to do it, what the budget's going to be, and you critically importantly decide what you want that end thing to look like, as you would with any other object. So do you want it to run the whole time? Do you want to make a film of it when it's in bits? Um, Who's going to run it? Who's going to wind it? Uh, All that kind of stuff. And then you um, take it apart and given health and safety of things like weights and springs and all that kind of stuff and uh, solvents used for cleaning the mechanism. But the vast majority of clocks and automaton as well, the vast majority are made out of brass and steel, some jewels in watches, glass, ceramics and other uh, materials, which, of course, you consult with other specialist conservators. But the actual workings or the mechanism, as clock people call them, are quite kind of straightforward, really. Said um, rather flatteringly said brain surgery, but it's really not brain surgery. Um, When I've worked, always uh, try to, and with, I think, great success, we did, a, again, at the Bose, we did a conservation project on a long case clock, on a grandfather clock. And uh, I sort of watched it and directed it a bit. But actually, to the textile conservators, the object conservators did the work. And it was absolutely brilliant. And it's not brain surgery. Um, take it apart, record it just like you would with any other object, um, wash it put it back together, put on some fresh oil, and then decide on a program of uh, not maintenance, but of um, uh, inspecting the thing every uh, periodic inspection to check the quality and condition of the lubricant. (sighs) That's that. That's all you need to know. (laughs) (laughs) You you made the sound a lot less scary than I imagined. Thank you. (laughs) And and I think that's a a, a problem. Uh, This is why I was really motivated to be a teacher and still am to do online teaching we do free open clock club and things like that because otherwise you have this very you know relatively small set of people so I think life looks pretty positive for dynamic objects in in uh, collections um. I actually think that's a really nice way to end it but I do have um, the other the thing I wanted to say was sort of brings us back around to where we started this conversation, this episode about where people come from when they get into dynamic objects. And w- uh, this is because I think in uh, as the C word, we think quite a lot about how we started out as conservators and what it is that kind of makes up a conservator, the skills that we have, the mm. extras, the, the other 
professions that we've been involved in and stuff. And I feel that there's quite a lot of, in the same way as there's quite a lot of sewers and makers and knitters and embroiderers in textiles conservation, there's quite a lot of for example, mechanics in in dynamics object dynamic objects conservation, and you Matthew started off in um, making clocks, and I wonder if that where we come from element in conservation really changes our attitude to what we how we feel objects need to be used or should be used, and where we feel the value of an object lies in a museum or out of a museum. It's a really good question. And I think, again, in my, uh, what I would laughingly call a career, that's changed remarkably. I think after the Second World War, there was um, a training scheme for retraining service people. And so that really put a lot of highly skilled engineering type people into the world of of, of clock repair. Mm. That set the scene for where we are, actually. Uh, but that is changing, I think, because thanks to the efforts, again, of West Dean College and Birmingham City University with their programme and the Watches of Switzerland educational programme, Warstep, which I think is at Manchester, um, they've moved towards degree programmes. And when I first kind of heard about this uh, you know, I thought, oh, gosh, that's not real horology and real craft and all that um, <laughs> kind of outdated tripe. Um, and now I have to uh, swallow my words and say it's the very best thing that could have happened because you can start out from the get go from either an undergraduate degree or from A levels or whatever and become a clocks conservator or a clock and watch in the case of uh, Birmingham conservator from the get-go and that to me is brilliant but yeah a whole group of new people younger people that are occupying that space who haven't been engineers or whatever they're not sort of second career people there's still obviously that goes on and it's really positive but it's interesting to see how that's change so the answer to where people come from i think it's changing an emerging professional recently asked me if there was a shortage of conservatives specializing in clocks and i said i couldn't possibly answer because i just don't know the field well enough but uh, i thought it was interesting that he was asking and uh, yeah i don't know what your thoughts are on it i mean yes is the answer i mean shout from the rooftops and this is a great uh, platform for that so thank you there is a massive shortage of clocks dynamic object conservators but inevitably, they kind of um, gravitate towards uh, London, Paris, continental Europe, those those kinds of places. And so you get this really healthy concentration of new thinking in London. But regrettably, and with, there are exceptions, of course, uh, but regrettably, in my experience in the North, there is more work then you can shake a stick at. And I'm not talking about museum and heritage work necessarily. I'm talking about, you know, work for private individuals, domestic clocks. Mm. There is absolutely loads. And the repair shop, you know, love it or hate it. And most people love it. It's doing a brilliant job for raising awareness of getting that granny's clock out of the attic and um, yeah. and getting it fixed. And we, you know, I wrote a book on it so people can do it themselves as well. Uh, such is the demand. But yeah, but certainly in clocks and dynamic objects, there is loads of work out there. So if you're interested, then yeah, rock up at um, Birmingham City or West Dean or anywhere else that offers a degree program training in in horology and uh, and go for it because you will never be short of work. Oh, you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> Uh, that's excellent. Uh, I hope you, uh, the person who asked me that question is listening because <laughs> there you go. That's the answer. <laughs> so today we have been talking about dynamic objects and we did briefly mention vehicles, but didn't go into it. But we shall sort of fix that now, actually, because I found myself so much to talk to about it. <laughs> Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hi, I'm Chris Weeks. I'm the Head of Collections, Care and Conservation at Max National Heritage on the Isle of Man, Ooh. based in Douglas. Very nice. So we actually kind of met because we were at the um, Dynamic Objects uh, sort of short chats, uh, short talks kind of thing the other week. Yes, yes. Yeah. And you mentioned that 
you have motorcycles in your museum and I was immediately intrigued. Tell me more. What what are what are these? <laughs> Well, the Isle of Man is famous for very few things, cats with no tails and so on. Um, and the, T- the TT race, the tourist trophy race, is one of them. Motorcyclists descend on the island and they race around it at terrific speeds on one of the only remaining unregulated road races in the world, actually. Wow. Now, it's been going since 1907 in various forms. It didn't really start out as a motorcycle race. In the early days, you couldn't get motorcycles to make it round a whole course like that. The whole course now is 37 and a half miles or somewhere near that. Wow. And it's uh, famous for its death-defying aspects. Uh, it really is quite incredible. And on the Isle of Man, we have, uh, we have a National Heritage Service, which I represent. We have never had on the island a dedicated exhibition or facility showcasing the history of the TT or uh, the technologies of the TT or uh, motorcycles in general. But so we do have a core collection of some motorcycles and um, racing sidecars and um, rather sorry collection of just one car. <laughs> <laughs> but we were, apparently we're going to be getting more of those. Oh. Anyway, we've been working in the last couple of years on a new... TT Gallery mm. at the Manx Museum here in Douglas, and that is slated to open next year, I think, in um, in June 2022. Yes, so that's that's the sort of context. I and mean, we've done an episode before about kind of large objects and working objects and that sort of thing. We did kind of talk about things that are so massive that they're like planes or boats or you know things that are insane. I feel like a motorcycle, you know, I I can picture quite easily because I've I've been near loads of them. <laughs> But that's still uh, a big beast with a lot of moving parts and oils and liquids and all sorts of different materials. And I can imagine that being a bit of a a challenge, really. Well, I'll level with you. I am a stone conservator. And uh, that's one of the things (laughs) that motorcycles don't contain. Yes. But only only one of the few. They are amazingly multimedia. And of course, uh, parts, they're made up of many of those. So they can be very, very complicated objects indeed and very difficult to get your head around. Mm. But the biggest problem of all with motorcycles and with cars, I guess, is that um, the endeavour to conserve these falls into one of those areas of conservation, which is, how shall I say, historically complicated by patterns of collecting and the desire of people to see things running and moving and being Mm. used. Yeah. So it's very, very tricky, very, very tricky. And where, where do you feel like you fall on that scale? Is this something you, you, you kind of want to have working, shown off in kind of a that sort of sense, or is this more of a static display piece? Well, if you look at motorcycling collections or motoring collections around the UK, almost all of them place an emphasis on that working aspect, that, that kinetic moving thing. Mm-hmm. And there's a, there's a TV series on at the moment about the Brooklands Museum, a sort of fly-on-the-wall documentary about Brooklands Museum down in the down near in Weybridge oh. in Surrey, which airs on UK TV if anybody's interested. It's a really good series. That is a typical example of your average motoring museum. If you take the opposite end of the spectrum, shall we say a collection like Science Museum, mm. which has type specimens in it. So those are um, considered to be of extreme technological or historical importance for one reason or another. And most of uh, their machines with the exception of a few classes of artefact, are static. Mm. And that would in- that would include cars and motorbikes, if, you know, such they have. So where do we stand on that? If it were a sliding scale, uh, we'd be sort of closer towards the science museum end. Mm-hmm. But that is that is a peculiarity of the kind of collection we've got, and I would not like to generalise about this at all. So we have an awful lot of sympathy with that sentiment that wishes to see and hear these things and smell them too. Yeah. It's an aspect of the identity of these objects, which is important to represent somehow. Yeah. And ossifying them stat- and making them static forever is destructive of that. So we try, to, we try to draw some sort of happy medium and probably we don't make it. But, you know, that's what we're aiming for. OK, that's an interesting thing. So you're aiming for a sort of balance in between. That's- if you've got a collection of machines, there may be some that are significant uh, for, um, for reasons of their design or mechanics and others that are, are um, famous for, for example, who wrote them, but they're absolutely um, not special in any other way. Mm. That's the kind of distinction we're looking at. So in the former category, we might be looking at halting them uh, from working because the risk of components failing is too great for us to take. 
One thing we never do, incidentally, is permit the vehicles to be driven on a track because the mechanical, the mechanical damage that could accrue from that is really very high. Mm especially with some of the older machines, which are two-stroke engines. Two-stroke engines um, can overheat for all sorts of reasons and fail catastrophically. Mm. If, we, if we consider the internal components of the engine to be important, then we must be trying to preserve those and not put them at risk of having to be replaced to service just one aspect of the life of the object, which is its you know, value as a kinetic moving thing. Mm-hmm. So what we do, we have... Um, Uh, care plans for all of the objects in our collection and we uh, run significant assessment on them and we try to work out whether we feel that they are approaching something equivalent to a type specimen or if they are if their main value is in being able to hear them and see them chugging you know that so it's it's a sliding scale and we try to we try to be as objective as we can about that i quite like that you have a sort of an individual approach so it isn't kind of a blanket approach of okay well nothing ever moves it can't be no yeah exactly and it can't be because they're so complicated aren't they yeah and they all have different identities and different histories we have a motorcycle that was ridden in 1979 unless you're a motorcycle anorak you probably wouldn't find this as fascinating as perhaps we do yeah. but uh it was ridden in an extremely significant race and was very famous in and of itself and uh we have that in our collection uh it was ridden by a rider called mike halewood who was very very famous at the time died shortly afterwards and some of the components in the engine are made from lightweight magnesium alloys which in aged engines like that have a tendency to fail preferentially Mm. so we will not be running that uh, machine and uh, we have a plan to in advance of showing it in our exhibition strip it down and reassemble it with what we would call preservation lubricants which are very heavy grade of oil basically to try to retard internal corrosion Mm. Uh, it'll never start again but we accept that yeah There are others that um, we were given for display that are under the express instruction that they should be kept running. They've been in that that way that motor museums often have, uh, restored to a point which we feel quite ambivalent about, actually. And therein lies the dilemma for us. Yeah. How do we do that and keep them on display? It's one thing to do that while they're in storage, but on display, that's quite another yeah, that is fascinating. Oh, I'm just trying to envisage like firing up something that's actually on display, like something on a plinth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. If we try to do it with the uh, with the one that I just mentioned, the two stroke Honda from 1962, it would be apocalyptic. <laughs> I'm going to put it no more strongly than that. Um, and there's no way that we could control it. So that has to come out of the gallery and go into the road and be started in the road wow. and then put back in the gallery. And we've got, uh, let me think, I think there are about, it's just under 10 machines like that. And what we've had to do is design plinths that can that we can pick up with the bike on them and move. Oh. So we're going to move the bike out on its plinth into the road, start it, and then bring it back in. Because one of my concerns was the risk of manhandling these things on and off display is obviously far greater than any damage you might do by starting it or not starting it, you know. Not only risk to the object, but also to the people handling it as well, I would imagine. Well, absolutely, yes, of course. And and, um, our exhibition designers have designed us a very nice display with a raised roadway running around the gallery. And um, you'd be risking life and limb just to get on it, really. (laughs) The purpose of running these ones is not to show people that they can go up and down the road, but it's to get the get the engines warm to dispel moisture from the lubricants. That is the purpose of it. So they have to be run warm, yeah. not hot, but warm, and then they're turned off and then they're brought back inside. Huh. We've yet to know whether this is a regime we're actually going to be able to follow through on because, of course, it's going to be very labour-intensive. Yeah. So it's going to take an awful lot of organising on my part to try and get it to work. But that's, um, that's the idea. It kind of sounds like a fun ritual, though. I mean, I know fun is probably <laughs> probably not how it actually feels. Uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, anything that we need to do regularly as conservators and collectors care people can be tedious at the best of times. But uh, I, I feel like that's like a, a ritual, like a like an annual pilgrimage. Like there's 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 something exactly, in yeah. there that's kind of exciting, and I really 
weird way. I don't know why. Well, I'm sure it would attract it would attract motorcycle buffs, you know. Oh, absolutely. We use here our, at Max Astral Heritage Robert Waller's risk analysis method. Okay. Um, and I've assessed the risks to the motorcycles of physical damage from riding them around a track or up and down a road um, as part of that. So we can quite clearly show the reasons why we don't wish to um, do that. It's a very tricky area to operate in. I mean, keeping a dynamic object sort of staying dynamic is, of course, you know, it's a commitment, <laughs> both in terms of time and money. It is. And also in, in the kind of constant explanation of like, this is why we do it this way. We have, uh, when we've been planning this project, we've been keen to stress a particular take on it. We are not interested in reproducing a um, motor museum. They have their place. Yeah. What we are able to bring to this is an exploration of what authenticity might mean in respect to these objects and that is a very very complicated thing to get across for example we've got a uh, the 2018 tt sidecar winner that came off the track covered in champagne and flies and is going into the gallery covered in champagne and flies and that for us is is critically important and all of our machines that we're showing along with all the other artifacts that are going in the gallery uh, are chosen for that reason, mm. because of the value of their authenticity. So we're not particularly interested in how the thing looks. We prefer it if bits are hanging off, really, frankly. <laughs> yeah. or, or we've got one of our best objects is the crashed a crashed TT sidecar from 2007, I think, mm. or 2006, I forget, which um, span off the track and burned. Wow. It's just a burned wreck. The rider ended up 50 metres away in a field, managed to walk away. Whew. Um, and the passenger was similarly unharmed. But the, the sidecar itself, there's no smoke coming off it anymore, but it is, it is left exactly as, it, as, it, as we got it, as a burned wreck, and it's quite an incredible object. Yeah. That, for us, is the essence of what we're trying to, trying to you know, put forth. So keeping things running has to sort of fit into all of that. Yeah. That can be, quite, can be quite a challenge, you know. I feel like it straddles a good line. I'm really excited about this. This is very cool. <laughs> well, we hope it will be. If people want to find out more, how can they um, find out more, aside from visiting it? People can visit our website, uh, maxnationalheritage.im, or they can visit our online offer, which is um, imuseum.im, I-M for Isle of Man, that is, mm -hmm. and uh, watch this space. We don't actually have any blogs on this at the moment. I might start one. As I haven't, I've got to do quite a lot of the conservation on all this stuff. Gosh. One of the things I, I didn't mention, and perhaps I should have mentioned, is that as part of our um, attachment to the idea of authentic authenticity, we've got ensembles of objects. So each of the bikes we've got has the rider's leathers, boots and helmet that went with it. Oh. And we are, hoping, we are hoping to display those costume ensembles with the motorbike. And sometimes these motorbikes, the motorbikes in question, are on the starting list. So it's incredibly difficult. And we're working with a conservation, costumes conservation company down in the south of England who are planning some funky mounts for us for our costumes that will allow us to show them in dynamic poses on the machines with which they are associated. Yeah, once the restrictions have lifted, ha ha, visit the Isle of Man because it is a crazy place and it's very, very beautiful here. It's a natural paradise as well as everything else, you know, <laughs> um, excepting the time when 80,000 80, bikers descend on the island during June. It's a natural <laughs> paradise. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, thanks so much for talking to the Sea Word today. I tell you what, it's a pleasure. Today I'm reviewing Handmade, A Scientist's Search for Meaning Through Making by Anna Poshaisky. And yes, that's the same Anna who co-hosted our episode on material testing a while back. This is a hot off the press 2021 publication from Bloomsbury Sigma. This book aims to explore material science in a really human way, by making stuff. In many ways, its whole approach is very close to how I feel conservators actually learn our trade. We learn by doing. The haptic feedback of making something or treating something informs us, tells us what's safe and what's beyond what we can ask of our materials. And that's sort of how this book goes. It's a journey, a reflection, and uh, you're bound to learn a thing or two along the way. The book is divided into chapters, as is normal for books, uh, each dealing with its own material, 
glass, plastic, steel, brass, clay, sugar, wool, wood, paper, and stone. The writing is a mixture of storytelling and popular science, and the book includes anything from the author's family history to difficult or joyful personal memories. I wasn't really prepared for how emotionally invested I'd become, but I'm actually surprised to say that this is a really personal book. It often incorporates history as well, exploring human making through time, not just via the author. So it's somewhere between a history book, a material science publication and a memoir. Honestly, it's sort of all three in one. Because Anna approaches everything as a scientist, there's a lot of tantalising problem solving in this book that I feel is really relatable to conservators. The sort of awkward phase of familiarising yourself with a new hobby or craft or conservation technique is very familiar to me and I like taking part in her discoveries. This isn't a conservation book per se, but I think it's a good fit for conservators, to be honest. It's an engaging, easygoing and vivid read, and I'd recommend it especially if you're a conservation student. Pick this up as a little primary in material science and consider your own journey with these materials. What's your relationship with paper? Do you have a love story with clay? A fraught one with wool? As the last selling point, there is conservation content in this book. Sort of, at least. We talk through issues of preservation, uh, rejoice when something is acid-free, and pay a special visit to the Mary Rose. The hardback costs around $17.99, and you can get paperback and ebook versions as well. So check out your preferred bookstore for more on that. It's got 278 pages, if I recall correctly, and really adorable black and white illustrations to boot. As usual, we welcome your questions, comments, and corrections. And this time I'm going to self-correct. In the beginning of the episode, I called something the Dynamic Objects Group. That's not right. Matthew had it right. It's the Dynamic Objects Network at Icon. They're different things, technically. I mean, I don't know that anyone cares, but there it is. There's a correction. If you're enjoying The C Word and would like to support our work, then please consider becoming one of our patrons. For as little as $1 per month, you can help us keep our episodes online and more of them coming. Patreon helps us meet our regular costs for the show, and also to plan ahead so we know roughly how much of a monthly budget we've got. That's super helpful when you're trying to do something special like buy a better microphone or save up to go to a special event. Your support also helps keep us free of advertisements. In return, our supporters get access to our archive of extended episodes, which you can only access on our Patreon page. Yeah, for that $1 a month, you get a little extra audio enjoyment. We've crunched the numbers, and it's about 10% extra content on a regular basis. That's not bad for less than a cup of coffee, eh? If supporting us sounds like something you'd like to do, then head over to patreon.com slash the C word and join our bunch of absolute champions. And a warm welcome to our latest patrons, Claire and Lauren. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for listening. We're The C Word and you've been listening to Matthew Reed, Chloe Rumsey and me, Jen Mathiason. Join us next time for an episode about leather conservation. In the meantime, check out our website at theseaword.show, tweet us at the Seaword Podcast, or simply email us on theseawoodpodcast at gmail.com. The intro and outro music is Spring by Didi Music, used under Creative Commons Attribution License. Additional music and sound effects by Callum Robertson. The Spinner Wooden Dice Production, 